You're listening to Wiretap with Jonathan Goldstein. Today's episode, the first thing that comes to mind. Last night, I dreamt of Dylan Thomas. In the dream, he is on tour through America and has just finished reading at a large American university. He is now at a professor's house for an after-reading soiree, and for some reason, I'm there too. I am wearing tweed, loafers, and tortoiseshell glasses. Dylan Thomas is deathly drunk. He is homeless drunk, fall off a roof drunk, and everyone is enjoying this. The party goers watch him storing up Dylan Thomas stories to tell friends on other evenings at other soirees. I watch him too, but as I do, I decide I will never tell anyone a single thing about this great buffoon. I will not share how he stuck a coat rack down his pants while exclaiming, "I am shoplifting." Nor will I share how he sat on our hostess's lap and called her "mama." Nor how he crawled into the hallway closet to roll around like a rutting pig amidst the host's shoes. Dylan Thomas is an ass, I think, and he does not deserve my celebration. Despite my distaste for Thomas's antics, I stay at the party longer than I should, as I have in this dream a dentist's appointment early the next morning. In the dream, this appointment fills me with a degree of anxiety, and so I drink more scotch than I am inclined to. But the scotch is good and is hitting me just right, and so I linger on, as does Thomas. We linger on, and all through the night, I carefully avoid him the best that I can. And in so avoiding him, I make small talk with a pretty young college librarian who is working on a portrait of Theodore Dreiser composed entirely of pocket lint. But by the end of the night, after all of my furious socializing, I look around to realize that everyone has left the party, and I am in the kitchen, drunk and all by myself. It is at this moment, as I am seated at the kitchen table, staring at a bowl of walnuts, that Dylan Thomas comes into the room. And sits down. He sits down right on top of the kitchen table, right in front of me. He spreads apart his legs so that his corduroy groin is directly in front of me. I know he is a legend, a genius, a troubled poet of great beauty. I know all of these things, and yet I refuse, out of spite or pride, or some combination of the two, to encourage him. And so I turn away. Pretending to examine a macrame carpet of a sunflower hanging from the kitchen wall. Everywhere Dylan Thomas goes, I think, everyone encourages him to act like a five-year-old. But right here, at this kitchen table, I'm drawing the line. I am saying no to all that. But still, out of drunken curiosity or something. I cannot help looking up shyly from the walnuts on the table to the face of Dylan Thomas. It's a face that is oily and pink, like the flesh of a cartoon elephant. Looking at it, I begin to soften. He smells of booze, but he also smells of old books. He is looking down at me, a cigarette squeezed into his mouth. He is looking at me with an expression on his face that I take to mean, "Let's cut the crap." Suddenly, I don't want to ignore him at all. Ignoring him feels phony, and I am drunk enough at this point to admit the truth. And the truth is, I want to impress Dylan Thomas. I want to make an impact. But the only problem now is that my mind is a complete blank. I have not a thing to say. I look directly into his drowsy eyes, eyes that are sunk into his rubbery, deflated balloon of a face, and that's when it comes to me: the words I will use to reach out to the great poet. And I speak them. I speak them as quickly as they form in my head. I speak them without weighing them nor considering them. I speak them just like this, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas. Rage, rage against the dying of the soiree. No sooner do I speak these words than I am filled with shame and regret. Sitting there at the kitchen table. I am struck by the thought of just how not a poet I am. I do not chase after immortality, wielding the brightest and best of my thoughts. Thoughts slowly whittled and smoothed during long pastoral walks. But rather, I make do with the first things that come to mind. And I have learned to live with the days, sometimes months, of regret, 
that follow these things. Follow them like stink follows a garbage truck. I wake up from this dream feeling slightly hungover and thirsty. I want orange juice, and so I decide to go into the kitchen and get some. Okay, first thing that comes to mind. You ready? Mm hmm. Bicycle. Applesauce. Corduroys. Dingo. The sky. Rapture. Pocket watch. Vinyl. Okay, now how, how did you get from pocket watch to vinyl?、Uh, my grandfather had a pocket watch with a vinyl strap. Okay, here's another one. You ready? Okay. Chicken chow mein. Rufy. How'd you do that? I don't know. Computer. Skittle. How do you get that?、Um, let's try it again. Say computer again. Okay. Computer. Skittle. I don't know. It seems to be what comes into my head. But it, it, like, I, speak so, I, I think so quickly. Like, I, get, I arrive at the point before I've even left. So, like, if I backtrack, sure, I can tell you why chicken chow mein made me think of a roofie or something. But the truth is, I'm already there. You fancy yourself a man who's very quick on his feet. You're very spontaneous. Thoughts just pop in your head and you act on them. You, you put a lot of credence into the,、uh, the first things that pop into your head. Yeah, I, just go, I, I like to just go for it. I like to think I'm, I'm hypersensitive. The way a martial artist feels the breeze across his skin and he knows how to bend and twist his body to avoid, say, a poisonous dart. That's how it kind of works in my head. My brain is like nimble. Uh huh. Mm hmm. You know, you know, there's that expression that they say, like, look before you leap. I leap. I just leap.、Mm-hmm. You see? Yeah. People are they're looking. Everyone's busy looking. How long do people look before they leap? They look a long time. Next thing you know, it's time for supper, and they'd even leap. They, they're looking, they're looking, and they go, supper, and they gotta go, and they gotta, you know. So it's all ruined. If you just leap, like you're already having breakfast. I'm going to give you a situation and I'm going to ask you what you do in that situation. All right. Okay? And you're just not going to. First thing that comes to your head is not going to be something that you're going to plan out or think about too much, okay? Because that's your forte, right? That's your metier in a way. That's right. Okay, you all set? Mm hmm. You're taking a walk along a country path. Okay. And you look over to your left, there's a lake, and there's a man drowning in the lake. What do you do? What's to the right? Just trees. What's straight ahead? It's just nothing. There's just path with nobody else there. Okay, and where am I coming from? You're just taking a, a walk along the path, but you see this man and he's drowning and he doesn't have much long to live. He's flailing about. Yeah, I figure like in the time that I've looked ahead and looked behind me and looked to the right,、uh, he's dead already. So I'm just going to keep walking straight. I mean, I tried, but I had to take into consideration what's around me. You have to diffuse your vision like a martial artist. You have to diffuse your vision. You have to see it all at the same time. What I would do at that point is I would fish his body out. You know, I've never really seen a dead body. So that might be kind of interesting. What are some situations where, where, where your spontaneity is, is an asset? I think a lot of it has to do. With kind of like how I even live my life, how I actually live day to day. Like, I changed my name, you know, quite a number of times to accommodate how I feel. But、uh, you, you, you weren't born with the name Howard? Well, my name was Howard, yes. I've changed my name since then. Oh, have, I didn't even know that. When did you do this?、Um, say a week ago, Thursday. So, what, what, is, what is your new name?、Uh, Humvee. Humvee? Yeah. I'm big, I'm bad, I'm blocky, I waste、oh, gas.、Like、But I don't spell it like the, like the car, that'd be really tacky. I'm, I'm, it's a capital H U M hyphen capital V. Humvee. Huh. And, and you, you, you don't drive a Humvee, do you? I don't actually have a license. But I, it's the, like, I feel that name represents who I am and what I am and where I'm going. Okay. So, this is catching on. People are, people are calling you Humvee? 
not yet. I'm trying um, to get it through their thick skulls that I'm not a Howard, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, Howard, I mean, Howard, I've always liked the name Howard. It's a nice name. It's a nice name. Well, I'm, I'm a Humvee, you know. It also helps, like, with my rap game. Like, um, Your rap game? What do you mean? Like, even just having the name Humvee allowed me to kind of, you know, use it for, for rapping, like, you know, for, like, for my rap game. And it made everything kind of flow. You when rap? I, I, yeah, I rap, yeah. Oh, you didn't know that? No, I, I, I didn't. That's interesting. I reach far and wide with my rhyming. You know, like Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Humvee had a big fall, had a big fall into a platter of vittles. You say computer, it makes me think Skittles, you know. So um, the speed of, like, in which I came up with Humvee, you know, that's the kind of, like, a hint at the spontaneity that I'm gifted with. You know, Humvee, spontaneity, makes me fast on my feet. You see, I can rap about any old crap, just throw it to me. You know, so, like, go ahead, take, take anything you want. Throw anything at me, and I can wrap it, gift wrap it. You know D- what I'm saying? Just anything. Anything. You'll just be able to, like, freestyle it? Yeah, I can just, you know, what does freestyle mean? It's like, um, you know, like when you're rapping and you just sort of improvise the lyrics. Okay. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. I'm always ready. Okay, um, okay, give me a rap about environmental issues. All right. Can you give me like um? I, I don't need. Would you really give me like a like a mmm mmm mm, mm. You want you want okay. Doom psh, do doom doom psh. Yeah, no, maybe this. Maybe I'll let this one come from my heart. I'll no beat. beat. Okay, go I'll ahead. Let my heart beat. Okay. Because you know, I, Humvee actually is is very concerned about environmental issues. Two, three, chicken. Mom, mom, what's with y'all? Why are you whipping out the Lysol? It's true, we're talking about the environment. This ain't something like spearmint. This is what puts you to test your skills against my ills. Um, so, like, usually when I finish, like, some heavy rhyming like that, like, I ask the, I ask the DJ to keep the, um, the backbeat. So imagine, like, your boom, chick, the boom. You, you want me to give you a beat? Uh, sure, that'd be great. To take us out? Yeah, t- take us out. Okay, you got some gigs you might want to plug? Yeah, yeah, let me just give my props. Okay, here we go. Doom, psh, doom, 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 yo, yo, uh, doom, you can catch me, I'll be doom, at my doom, mom's doom, place. Psh. So come chicken, 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 chow mein, check it out. <laughs> How, Howard? Yeah? How, are you okay? Yeah, that, that was my rap laugh. You know, like, all the big rappers, they have a rap, rap laugh. Wow, because uh, it sounded it sounded like you were choking. It's like, you know, it's my it's like my tip of the Kango hat to like, you know, keeping it real in the you know, in the hood style. Like it's not like I don't want to rip off anybody, I'm like an original, you know. Let me hear it again. <laughs> yeah, it really sounds like you're like you know, like you're you're choking or you're being strangled or something. I mean in like in you know, in the, you know, rougher parts of the hood that's that's how people laugh. It's here to stay, and I don't play, yo. Ever since I was young, you know, when when a lot of girls were getting these huge, massive crushes and would talk about who they liked, and, you know, I just was always really uncomfortable with it, and it seemed either silly or stupid or, you know, and then... I never had those those crushes like you know you're all at a slumber party and everybody's sort of picking their you know the the um, member of Duran Duran that they have a crush on mm-hmm. and I would just sort of um, you know and, and some girls would get all squealy and just say like oh I love Simon Le Bon or something and I the way that I picked the member of Duran Duran that I had a crush on was I picked whoever did not get picked by other people and then, you know, felt sorry for. So it was always, I think, Roger, maybe, was the drummer. There was a member of, of Duran Duran called Roger? I think so. He may, it, it, he could see nobody knew about him. There was, like, Nick Rhodes and John Taylor and Simon the Bond, and nobody knew about this, the drummer. So, yeah. so I always said I had a crush on the drummer, even though I didn't really. 
so you know because of all this history of like feeling like you know I, I didn't wasn't engaged in that same kind of you know getting really excited about boys or it, it didn't feel just easy and and well I I mean I did like boys I did like boys it was just that when when it came to um sort of sexual interactions I would find myself really uncomfortable or um and not scared just like uh, it was almost a drag <laughs> So I guess it was my sophomore year um, in college, and I went to a, a very liberal liberal arts school, or at least that was the reputation. And well, and part of our orientation, you know, included talking about you know both the dangers and the I guess you know since it was so liberal, also the pleasures of um, sex and alcohol and drugs. Um, and the the idea of of questioning one's sexual identity um, sort of permeated the school. For me, a lot of the questioning that was going on um, sort of made a lot of sense. And I sort of started to become convinced, in a way, that that I may be gay. It almost seemed like this like logical conclusion, you know. Okay, you know, if if the evidence is, you know, that I've always been uncomfortable, that, you know, I I I was never as as into liking people as you know other you know other girls were. I felt uncomfortable in sexual situations with boys. I, you know, and and all of those things. It seemed like you know that plus that plus that plus that equals, you know, well I must like women. It was um, over winter break, and I was home, and I was staying with my mom, and um, we had just eaten breakfast, and uh, and all of a sudden, I, I I really I don't know exactly how it happened, but I told my mom, you know, that I might be a lesbian, and my mom was, you know, she sort of was quiet for a little while. Um, she kind of got tears in her eyes, and, and I got tears in my eyes, and, and you know, she, she was saying that, you know, what it comes down to is I am her child, and, and I am going to be who I am, and, you know, that she's going to love me and support me no matter what. And you came out to her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get, you know, essentially, I mean, now, looking back at it, yeah, that, I mean, that's that's sort of how I refer to it, um, you know, with my friends is, oh, remember when I came out to my mom? Were there women that you, that you found, that you liked? Mm, no. See, yeah, that would be, that would be an important part <laughs> of the whole lesbian thing, right? <laughs> Right, but the, but yeah. You know, I've I've been in a relationship with a man for five years now, and and I obviously have an attraction to men. So I know that I'm not a lesbian. Usually when I think about it, I just think, you know, what, what was I doing? <laughs> um, you know, because usually it's like people even may live, you know, as, as a, a gay man or, you know, a lesbian for years without ever coming out to the people in their family. Um, and I sort of did it without ever actually living it.
As a kid, as a 17-year-old kid, coming to the end of my CJEP career, it was time to make some uh, applications to go to university. And at that time in my life, I was pretty much overwhelmingly convinced that the only real place for me to be doing any schooling was at the university in the uh, communications program. Uh, I had some interests that I developed in high school, whatnot, in, uh, in mass media and film and photography. I was very much captivated by the idea of media, and I had a lot of my identity wrapped up in media. So it seemed to me that communications was really one of the only places where I could really explore these issues. So the idea was to put together the best possible portfolio to ensure that I would get through to the interview stage and then prepare myself extensively to be 100% on for that moment. Mm -hmm. So the moment came. On the day of the interview, I was very extremely excited and, and anxious to get it, get on with it because I really felt that this is where I wanted to be and this is where my future really lay. Um, and finally they called me in and I went in and uh, the interview rolled along fantastically. I felt really great with everything that was going on. I felt that my answers were really clear and concise and got at what they were looking for. And I realized that, wow, this is really good. These people, I can really connect with them. And I, I really feel like this is a place where I could really learn. So things were rolling along extremely smoothly, and I felt really, really relaxed. Mm -hmm. And then it came out of left field. What did? A question that I didn't even imagine being asked, they said. What's your greatest social concern? Dumbfounded. Nothing, nothing, nothing came to mind. I sat there blank, and I remember the feeling in my stomach starting to bubble up and feeling it moving up to my chest, but nothing would come to mind. Nothing at all, and they pushed me, and they kept pushing me. They kept saying, come on, just give us something, give us something. And I was sitting there with a blank look on my face, and then all of a sudden, it popped into my mind. Potholes. Potholes? Potholes. And they said, potholes? And I said, potholes. They said, potholes? That's your greatest social concern? And I just kind of looked at them with that face like, that's what I'm saying. Potholes. And so they proceeded to engage me in a series of questions about how I would make a film about potholes, to which I found myself describing tires smacking into asphalt, tires exploding in asphalt. I limited myself and contained myself to this ludicrous social concern. And, and so you ended up, it ended up that you, you didn't get in. I did not. But now, like now, what's it like, 10 years later or all these years later? Many, and, many more years later. And now you're actually, you're doing a PhD in, in communications, that very field. In that very program. One of the things, I think the big uh, repercussion of that uh, pothole answer was that I've really put a lot of time and thought into being fast on my feet and thinking fast on my feet and having something to say uh, in a moment where I might not necessarily have something to say. Have you ever, like in replaying the event of the interview over and over or years later in your mind, which maybe you've done, um, have, you, have you ever constructed in your mind an argument that would have actually placed potholes as a legitimate social ill? I don't think I could position it as the greatest of social problems, but I could position it today, I think, as a social problem, particularly if we talk about the megacity and the megacity mergers. The potholes on the street and the lack of care that's put into our city streets is pretty much emblematic of the way the system is operating today. In, in hearing you talk about this, um, I... I I find myself wondering, like, in some ways, do, do you still feel like that that 17-year-old kid who's still trying to get into the communications pro BA program? Are, are you still trying to convince, you know, yourself and me that you're that you're good enough, that you're smart enough? I don't think I like this question. Well, I mean, I'm just I'm just are trying you to like me a fraud. No, no, I'm not. I'm trying to create like a, a psychological portrait. You think because I told you this story, you actually know something about me? Well, I think it, re it did reveal something about you, I think. Who do you think? 
What do you, where do you come off thinking you know something about me? Well, I thought maybe like we could penetrate to a deeper level together on the phone. I thought that would be cool. There's no penetration between you and me. Okay, so since you're such a, you know, obviously such a different person now and everything, and, you know, you're, you're much better at thinking on your feet, right? Right. So, okay, let's, 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 I'm just going to, I'm going to throw a curveball your way and we'll see what you, what I'm you, ready. Okay, you ready? What for you is the greatest love of all? What do you mean? What do I think is the greatest love of all? This is, I'm, I'm asking you a question. I'm asking you to, you know, roll with this question. What, what do, you, what do you think is the greatest love of all? See, you can't come up with anything. You're still that frightened 17-year-old kid who's trying to fib his way into a program where you shouldn't be. You want to know what the greatest love of all is for me? Yeah. Hello. 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 Everybody's searching for a hero. People need someone to look up to. I never found anyone who fulfilled my need. A lonely place to be. So I learned to depend on me. I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadow. If I fail, if I succeed, at least I'll live as though you leave. No matter what they take from me, they can take away my dignity because the grace. The voices you heard on Wiretap today were K.C. Werbin, Allison Brody, and Howard Chakowitz. Wiretap is written by Jonathan Goldstein and produced by Jonathan Goldstein with Sarah Gilbert and Carolyn Warren. You can reach us through our website at cbc.ca slash wiretap. This summer, tune into Wiretap Sunday afternoon at 1, 4 Pacific Time, and Tuesday evening at 8.30.